Hello, everyone. I'm Ernie Humphrey, the CEO of Treasury Webinars. I would like to thank you for joining us for the webinar today, Cryptocurrency, Blockchain, and Treasury. Our company is ready. I'm incredibly excited to finally be covering these topics. My apologies for not covering this topic sooner. It's something that obviously should be top of mind uh, to corporate treasury because I strongly feel that cryptocurrency, and we'll get into the nuances, cryptocurrency, digital currency is not going anywhere. So we're starting to see some traction, much more so overseas, which is not surprising. So a little bit uh, about what motivated me today uh, to finally address those topics. There is some amazing content being put out um, by my friend of mine, Rupert, at, at Complex Countries, and they had a great call um, with several treasurers and treasury executives overseas. And so uh, one of the gentlemen um, who was involved in that call uh, was Simon Jones. He's an executive treasury consultant. So I'm honored to have as our key speaker, um, Simon Jones today. So good good luck for you. You won't have to listen to me very much today. Um, so Simon, welcome to the webinar. Can you give us a little bit um, about your background and why this topic is such, such a passion for you? Yeah. Thanks, Ernie, and it's it's an absolute pleasure to be uh, on the webinar today with with everyone. Um, I'm a I'm a corporate treasurer by profession and from the UK for many years ago. I then, in my career, spent a long time um, at various executive leadership uh, positions at JP Morgan, um, building the transaction banking business in the Pacific uh, and also in the in the EMEA region. I worked very extensively uh, with the e-commerce teams, particularly at JP Morgan during my time. And I saw uh, the fintech was really growing very fast. Digital payments uh, online was becoming the norm. Uh, there was a huge growth um, uh, around, that, around the world. And I decided I really wanted to become part of that going forward. Um, so after a long career at JP Morgan, I uh, decided to join um, uh, uh, and uh, become a mentor and investor in fintechs uh, in here in the UK. Um, and uh, uh, I also then joined a brand new bank called ClearBank, <clears throat> which some uh, some of your listeners may have uh, may have may have heard of or may have seen. It's a brand new um, payments clearing bank in the UK. Um, and that bank does actually service a number of crypto players. So I got pretty familiar um, with the crypto exchanges and the players uh, as, a, as a result of that. So that's a little bit about my background. That's how um, I've been in digital payments, I would say, for you know, 10, 15, 20 years, as long as it's been going on. Um, but we really are seeing quite an interesting revolution uh, starting to happen around crypto. But I'm also, um, I'm going to be very clear, Ernie, I'm not a, I'm, I'm a very much a crypto skeptic. I'm a corporate treasurer. That's good. I'm a risk manager by profession. So um, hopefully your listeners will hear that there's a, there's a healthy amount of skepticism um, a, a around what we're going to talk about today. And I'm going to try and be very realistic about, um, you know, what I feel treasurers will have to probably end up dealing with on crypto but also be very realistic where you know the risk appetite is just not right at, at this point in time okay great let me go ahead and uh, cover a few housekeeping items and give a quick overview of our agenda before i hand the floor back uh, to simon uh, first of all i want, want to let you know um, we can take your questions in the questions area if you go to have in our control panel so what you're going to see today is a little bit different um, we're going to really have Simon walk us through some content. Slides are just for your takeaway. And then we're gonna go ahead and open it up for questions uh, so we can hit questions throughout uh, the session. So you have a very unique opportunity to tap an amazing expert. As Simon said, he's really been at the forefront of this. He's been a treasurer. So he has the, the treasurer mindset. Um, and so obviously in the US, we always seem to be a little bit behind the curve. And so it's really important for that. Also, uh, if you have an interest, uh, in receiving a certificate of attendance for today's webinars, you can submit for CTP or credit related to your CPA. Please send an email to Ernie um, at treasurywebinars.com. And afterwards, uh, we will have the recording uh, posted so you can take a look at that uh, as well. So what Simon's going to cover, again, is going to be a discussion um, after we go through some basics. We're going to talk about um, some blockchain basics. Uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, digital currency versus cryptocurrency, uh, and then we'll get into, uh, you know, uh, the mindset, right? Um, perceived versus actual, uh, 
actual cryptocurrency risk. We'll talk about the risk exposures, real versus perceived, uh, and then we'll get into a conversation really about why treasurers are using crypto and maybe why they're not uh, using crypto. And obviously, we'll we'll tailor the conversation, uh, you know, around folks that are maybe overseas, international, and those of us in the U.S. who are uh, senior treasury folks. And then, as always, we'll try and offer you um, some key takeaways to take back to the office. Uh, so please. Uh, let's make this a little interactive. And of course, you're all excited. Uh, all right. Well, let me go ahead and uh, go ahead and get things started. I have some polling questions uh, that I have, but let me go ahead and I need to re revise those things. So, Simon, let me go ahead and hand the floor over um, to you and uh, uh, go ahead and uh, give us a little overview on blockchain and the mechanics. Great, thanks, Ernie. So, so first of all, there's a lot of lot of buzzwords out there around blockchain, digital currency, and crypto. So I'm going to really start first of all on really talking about the the mechanics around what links a lot of those different concepts that that I've just talked about: blockchain, crypto, uh, um, and digital currency. Basically, the technology that is underlying a lot of this uh, is blockchain technology, which is extremely important and something that's been, you know, we've heard a lot in the treasury industry about probably over the last five or six years about how blockchain was going to be so important and, and take over the world. What is interesting is it's taken time to develop, but the underpinnings of blockchain technology are, are in all of those, all of the digital currencies and all of the cryptocurrencies that, uh, that we will talk about later. So blockchain technology enables everybody to see instantaneously at the same time a transaction as it's happening, it is as it's confirmed by the other parties, and everybody is seeing the same thing. So instead of having a database with one part, with one party and a database with another party, you're actually all sharing a concurrent databases across the blockchain at the same time, which really me, which really means um, everybody's seeing the same thing and there is no need for reconciliation afterwards because you've all got the same data, the same information. And I think that's a really important point as to how we see this technology developing over the, over the long run. Why is blockchain important? Don't just think about it as for cryptocurrency, but a blockchain as a distributed ledger could be used for all sorts of things. It could be used for bond issuance and people owning bonds, for example. It could be used for us owning anything. It could be our own houses, for example, on a blockchain. So the technology itself, the distributed ledger technology, um, is, is something that you're going to see, we're all going to see much more of uh, in the future, but it also underpins digital currencies uh, and, and cryptocurrencies. So if we look at the flow of transactions on this slide, if I want to send, A wants to send money to B or anything of value, so it might be that particular bond, for example, the transaction is registered with the sender uh, and the recipient and is time stamped uh, and has a value. It is then broadcast to the participants on a particular blockchain that has the permissions to be able to see activity on that blockchain. If those participants are comfortable that A is sending value to B, then they will validate and confirm those transactions on the blockchain. They might get a reward for it. They might not get a reward for it for doing that. But basically, people that are not A and B on that blockchain is also confirming that that transaction is real and that that transaction is not a double spend it is a true movement of value from A to B. Once that has happened and the nodes have confirmed it and the people on the blockchain have confirmed that, then the transaction, again in real time to all the participants, is added to uh, the previous block using a hash, a mathematical hash function, and that provides immediate transparency and that record cannot be changed. And that is a really important point because unlike our payment clearing where we could potentially pull back a transaction, that's not possible on a blockchain. Once the record is done, the record is done. If you have to, to reverse it, you would have to send another transaction 
um, to, to reverse it. And the value moves from A to B. But I want everyone to just think about it. Don't just think about this as being uh, a digital currency. Think about that blockchain being used for transfer of ownership of a house, transfer of an ownership of a bond, for example. Lots of different use cases um, we will start to see, and I'll touch a little bit more on that later on in the webinar as well. Okay, can, can, can I, I let me jump in here? Um, just because this came up a few times already, I know it might not be easy um, to explain, but can you explain what a uh, hashtag, I, I can't even say the word, hashtag mathematical, the, that, that piece of it is, the hashtag mathematical function or whatever that part was? I'm, I've never heard that before, so I'm getting a few questions about it. Yeah, no, I, 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 I'm sure, I've, but uh, um, basically the participants on the node will create a new mathematical um, code or a hashtag code that basically will mean that that record cannot be changed. All right, unless unless you you know have the ability to to uh, break that code. But that would, would need an awful lot of computing power and mathematical genius to be able to break that code. And, and you know, some people do that. That's how you you hear about people, you know, taking things from um, uh, from from cryptocurrency wallets, uh, etc. Um, but that's basically what happens. So that there is a, it, it's like I would say a confirmation number that we're used to in banking, okay. but it's a, a very long mathematical um, formula that is unique to that transaction that locks that transaction down which means it can't be reopened or a come and cannot be changed okay thank you sorry i just wanted to no that's it's, it's, it's a good question and uh, yeah. yeah so if we take what blockchain technology and then go on to what what is a cryptocurrency a digital currency a cryptocurrency is basically a digital currency so a digital currency could be for example a central bank digital currency or it could be a cryptocurrency, which is not necessarily supported by the central bank. So digital currency um, is using a blockchain technology, but it is using encryption techniques to basically make sure that that formula cannot be broken and regulate the generation of the units of currency. So if I'm transferring A to B, that is the only uh, um, uh, ownership that is changing. You cannot then create a, a, another another amount of that particular currency. That currency has usually on a cryptocurrency a limited number of tokens that are issued in the market that are out there, and therefore, if there is a financial resource, uh, you know, in, in there, if there is not an infinite resource, then the value of that, if somebody wants to buy one, will continue to go up in value because there are no longer others being being minted or, or created. These currencies do not have any central bank money behind it. They don't have gold, as we would normally uh, expect to be um, behind our, our national currencies or our fiat money. So they are working independently of the central bank. And you know they are worthless unless you want it at a certain price. So a Bitcoin as the symbols here, or Ether as the symbols, uh, first symbol on the bottom here is, it in theory is worthless, but if it's worth X to somebody else and they're willing to pay for it, then that's the value of it at that particular point in time. But I think it's always very important to remember that there is nothing, there is nothing physical that sits behind that, either central bank money or gold or whatever. It's only worth as much as the next person will pay for it. Now, let me let me jump in here. This, I'm getting too technical, but I have my treasury treasury geek hat on. So, yep. is, is there regulation around who decides the number? Like, I know there's a set number of bitcoins, and when the other digital currencies get established, is that something that's just decided? Or I'm I'm just kind of I'm just kind of trying to understand yeah. if there's it, regulation behind that piece of it. Ernie, it, it, it varies by which particular coins you're talking about. So yeah. there are people that mint new coins all the time, etc. And 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 uh, uh, um, they may have different numbers. But something like Bitcoin, for example, has actually a, a well-known finite amount of Bitcoins right. that are available in circulation. And a lot of it has to do with the blockchain technology that it's sitting on, and the ability that that technology has to be able to create new coins and mint new coins. 
So that's the reason why you see, you know, quite volatility in Bitcoin prices, for example, because really nobody can create any new Bitcoins. There is only X number in circulation um, at, at this at this particular point in time. Okay. Hopefully that 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 gives you a help. But you know, not all coins are the same. They, they will be very different. So I think this next point probably helps illustrate it quite well. Typically, when we send fiat money, and I hopefully I'll use it, I will use this term more often. So whether that be dollars, pounds sterling, or euros, that is commonly known in the industry as fiat money. If I'm one person sending money to somebody else and I'm using Venmo or I'm using PayPal, then really what I'm doing is I've got some money on my PayPal wallet and I'm moving it to somebody else's PayPal wallet. The money is already in PayPal and PayPal is acting as that intermediary, just like a bank, um, in order to, uh, to move that money from you know, the person on the left to the person on the right. Back to that point around databases. That is going through PayPal's or Venmo's database for the exchange of value that is happening. I may have to then reconcile that in my own database, but I'm going to have to reconcile that. That is not going to equal the database of PayPal at this point in time. So hopefully that gives you a, a little bit of an idea of the difference. So there are always intermediaries in place in traditional finance that we've, we've obviously been living and breathing for all of our careers. What is different about cryptocurrency is it's an open peer-to-peer -peer network where there is no central counterparty that is reconciling and being the intermediary. You may have a central counterparty that you're buying that cryptocurrency from, i.e. An, an exchange, for example. But the reality is that the value is going from one person to another person on that blockchain with the agreement of all of the participants on that on the nodes um, to verify that particular transaction. And there is not a need for an intermediary. You'll hear term used in the industry around decentralized finance because you really don't need to have an intermediary to do it. If you are crypto fluent enough and you want to manage your own crypto assets um, you know, uh, 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 with a custodian, then you don't actually need to go through a central counterparty, for example, to move that money. You can move that money with your with your um, with your passwords, etc. You can send that money from one person yourself to somebody else um, without having to go through a central counterparty. Everybody knows the value that's changed hands because everybody has on those particular nodes on that blockchain all has visibility to what has particularly happened. So just hopefully that shows, that illustrates the difference and potentially how decentralized finance potentially means that I can send money to Ernie and I don't need to go for anybody else. I can just send money to Ernie, um, you know, if, if we were going to do it in, in a cryptocurrency. And that is what's known as decentralized finance. Now, that has a lot of questions around who's regulating it, and who's, who's, <laughs> who's doing the checks and the balances. I'll go on to that later on, but you know that, that is that is still something that's very much being uh, evolving in the industry. Okay, thanks, Simon. I'm just going to uh, give everyone opportunity. We have a few obviously questions coming in, um, right. so we'll look through those. Um, some of what I'm trying to do is hold those back um, as we kind of go through those topics. Um, but 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 there's a few that I think uh, really fit here well with some kind of uh, the basic basic um functionality here um and so uh, so in terms of you know the buying and selling and the exchanges can you talk a little bit um about people i know it's going to be a big thing for companies um how do these exchanges what i will call become legit so how does how does how do yeah. these exchanges work yeah it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant it, it, it's a great question ernie and um there are a lot of exchanges out there there are a lot that are unregulated um, I uh, do not recommend anybody do any transactions and touch with an unregulated exchange. Um, my personal, you know, career, uh, you know, in, in banking, um, you know, I've always made sure that the entity is properly regulated in the market that I'm dealing with and, and they're combined by all of the KYC and anti-money laundering um, controls, et cetera, that the regulation requires. But there are a lot of exchanges out there, um, so you do need to be very careful. From my um, discussions 
and other other webinars and conferences that we've had with corporate treasurers the one thing that i think is very sensible that the ones that are using cryptocurrency for their businesses have always said to me that they like to go to a regulated exchange in their particular market but also regulated in in a number of markets around the world but also a crypto exchange that is a publicly listed entity um, you, you're aware there are some in the US like that um, that are very highly regulated, that are regulated in, mar in multiple markets. Um, in my mind, if you're a corporate treasurer and you're having to use this, and I use the word having to use this, that would be, from my experience, what other large US companies have decided to do. Um, and, you know, to use a publicly listed exchange and an exchange that is fully regulated in multiple markets around the world to give them that, that particular footprint. I would not touch any of the unregulated exchanges. Um, to give you, you know, an idea, I, I don't want to recommend any names or anything, but I'm sure you all well know, you all know Coinbase in the US that is publicly listed exchange. It is highly regulated in many markets around the world. But the biggest exchange in the world is a company called Binance, which is quasi Chinese owned, but is actually not owned anywhere in the world. It doesn't really have a headquarters. Um, need I tell you, need I say any more <laughs> about that? <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Um, and then one more, we got so much to get to. So uh, this is a question, I'll try and frame it um, in the terms of, of, our, of our audience here, uh, treasury folks and CFOs. So uh, I, I hear and people have questions about is a crypto wallet, how does it work? How is it like a bank account and, and what are, are there differences between yep. how we look at those two things? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's great. It's a great point in question. So um, the discussions that we've done with other corporate treasurers who have actually opened up accounts at or wallets up at a crypto exchange, um, it is just like opening a bank account. So you have to go through all of the KYC due diligence, et cetera, that you would expect the bank would do. Um, for you to open an account. Instead of it being an account for fiat money, although the, the crypto exchanges will also probably allow you to hold a wallet in fiat money as well, um, but basically you can then open up a wallet for each um, cryptocurrency that you want to receive or you, that, that you want to um, uh, you know, buy or sell on that particular exchange. So you might have one for Bitcoin, you might have one for Ether, um, you know, you might have, uh, you know, one for others, but you probably also have your own fiat wallet. The um, explanation that I've heard from corporate treasurers that, that have done it, and, and particularly U.S. companies, it is as painful as opening a bank account <laughs> as one of the big global banks. So I won't take away any myth that it's any easier. It's not because you're dealing with a regulated exchange that is basically going to go through the same KYC due diligence criteria. And if they're not, you should be worried about it. <laughs> Right. So it's maybe a rhetorical question, but, um, you know, in terms of moving the Bitcoin back and forth through the exchange, um, are there standard fees? Are there hidden fees? Are they taking a spread or can you? Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely right. So they're going to usually take um, a, a spread between um, one, one currency and another. The spreads are, as the market is still fairly immature, fairly wide. So if I remember the days of FX, say 20 years ago, those sort of spreads will be, will be, you know, quite, quite the norm, I would say, um, you know, in the industry, particularly going between, um, you know, crypto and, and fiat or fiat to crypto uh, in that way. Um, you may also have custody fees as well. Some people may use an exchange, but then have a custodian that's, that's different from that exchange. Um, then there may be typical type of custody fees like you would again expect um, for normal um, safe custody fees that you have in, in the fiat world as well. Okay, great. I mean, we, this could be an eight hour webinar, so hopefully everyone's getting an appetite. So we will definitely, <laughs> hopefully have more uh, with Simon um, and others. So, so let's go ahead and start talking about the risk um, perceived versus actual. Um, yep. And so, so this is, this is Ernie speak, not Simon. Um, I like to have uh, perceptions versus reality in terms of risk. So uh, Simon, can you kind of begin by running us through some, you know, some of the perceptions, kind of uh, what they came, you know, kind of what you've seen, uh, really, if you've seen the differences maybe between the rest of the world and the U.S., and then uh, give us a little reality check on those. Yeah. So 
uh, you know, the perceptions out there and, 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 you know, crypto is the wild west at the moment. You've, you know, you've got um, speculators at a personal level, speculators at an institutional level, piling into crypto, trying to make a quick buck. Um, uh, and the DeFi protocols that I talked about, where you're not necessarily doing it through an intermediary or a well-known ex regulated exchange, um, you know, it, it, it can be extremely risky. Um, so particularly in the decentralized finance where you're moving money from one person to another on the blockchain, do you really know who that other person is? Are they stealing your money? Are they gonna, gonna go and steal your money? Um, a lot of that happens in DeFi type protocols because there is not, you know, there is not the, uh, the exchange or the intermediary that is checking that that person does exist and they are who they say they are, etc. It is very high risk because of that fraud and that protect potential around people, um, uh, you know, defrauding you, um, uh, tricking you into parting with money, etc. But equally, it's very high risk because of the volatility in the value of the particular coins. Um, I'll go into a little bit further on this. So the perceptions are that it is highly volatile. I'll talk to you a little bit more about the reality of that, which uh, it still is high risk. Um, but um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll cover that in, in the next slide. Now, one of the things that a lot of corporate treasurers said to me on calls is, well, crypto is anonymous. Well, actually, it's not. Certain coins are anonymous. So somebody like something like Monero, for example, is an anonymous coin. And I wouldn't deal with it at all for that reason, because criminals can easily hide behind that, uh, et cetera. But actually, Bitcoin, um, Ether, uh, uh, et cetera, and a lot of the more well-known coins, what is very interesting about crypto is that you can see the exchange of value between people through the entirety of the life of that particular coin on the blockchain. So if you've got the right software and uh, uh, software to be able to interrogate that blockchain, you can actually go back many years, many hundreds of thousands of transactions on that particular blockchain and see where, you know, who's exchanged value with you. Now, what is interesting on something like a, a Bitcoin, for example, is you might not actually want to see some of that value because blockchain has been around for a long time. It's been around for when, you know, North Korea was, you know, is involved in it. You've got all sorts of, the, of, of parties on the chain that will give you anti-money laundering uh, um, and, and um, uh, sanctions issues if you go back through the chain. But if you think about US dollar cash, when you bank it in a bank account, you don't really know well, how many parties, who's had that before. It could have been drugs money, it could have been you know, diamond smuggling or whatever at some part of the world. So actually, blockchain technology and crypto is actually more transparent than people are led to believe. So that you know, is a perception that I think is really important for people to understand. And we'll talk a little bit more about, about how, you, uh, how you can use that to benefit later on. The other key perception is, oh, crypto is not for transactions. It's not for me. It's, you know, my kids are investing in it. Um, I, you know, people are speculating in it for speculative investment only. Um, and that's, you know, that, that's all it's any good for, good for. I'll get you to back to some of the reality of that. Very much that's where it started. Um, uh, it, it, it started, you know, over the last, I'd say, five years or so. Um, but that, that is certainly changing. The final key point, I think, for treasurers is, I, and I get regularly, well, you know, I just don't need to get involved in this. It's all too risky. It, it's, you know, it, it, it's all too complicated. Um, and therefore, I can avoid it. So if I go on to the reality, I'll um, <clears throat> go to the next one, Ernie. That's perfect. Um, then I think, you know, as I cover that, that, that last one, um, uh, I think you'll find there's a reality, the bottom bullet on this, is that crypto is also being used as the transfer of value in the digital economy. My interaction with corporate treasurers have been, if I'm going to create a digital asset to sell out, to sell into the market, I'm gonna to need to, the business, the marketing functions in companies, the brand creators or whatever, 
are realizing that they can't only just use use fiat and use credit cards to pay for things. Actually, the target audience are people that have got crypto coins and they'd like to spend some of that wealth that they've probably been generating over the last few years, um, for, for example. So I think the reality is I mentioned around regulation. Uh, there are increasingly number of regulated players in the market, um, which is a very good thing. Um, but I think also the regulators have been pretty slow in the US, in, in the UK and in Europe as well, and in Asia. They've been pretty slow at regulating these players and getting their hands around uh, what it means to be regulating these players. Um, but you've seen, you know, you've seen activity happening in the U.S. Um, you know, in, in, in the Biden administration and, and the Senate to bring more regulation into the space. Um, and you've seen the FCA being very active here in the U.K. as well uh, in, in, in regulating players in the market and also shutting down unregulated players in the market as well, um, which, which you know, unfortunately is happening. So I think that's the reality that you'll see many more regulated players you know, in, in the future. Um, crypto is not backed by any government or central bank. You always have to remember that. So that is the reality. It is only worth as much as somebody else will pay for it. So that could be zero tomorrow uh, if you're not careful. But typically you will see volatility of plus or minus 20 percent over a few days is not unheard of in something like Bitcoin or, 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 or other. Um, or, or, or other uh, cryptocurrencies, for example. So you need to be aware that sort of risk you're taking if you're holding it. And I and I will say if you're holding it, because we'll we'll come on to uh, the, of how corporate treasurers are using it going forward. Crypto is being used as an investment. You'll see some high-profile U.S. companies uh, having invested in it. Tesla, for example, MicroStrategies uh, is the other big one out there. Um, that, 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 is, that is invested in, in crypto as part of their corporate treasury activities. I'm not going to be an advocate for saying that's a good thing to do. I think that's something that is very high risk, and I think you need to be uh, you need to make sure that the board has signed off on anything like that, but um, becoming a reality or not. And I'm not going to recommend it at all. Okay. Uh, thanks, Simon. Let me uh, give you a pause here. Um, do a little uh, Q and A. Um, section here folks i've um, got some questions so i want to remind you um go ahead um and keep uh keep your questions coming in and i will do my best to get these uh out to simon uh so simon um i i think this fits uh fairly well here um uh, we're gonna tee it up a little bit right talking about uh you know talking about the risk and the actual which you just did so in terms of uh so we mentioned that a limiting factor for the number of whatever units might be the technology so let's talk about bitcoin so um, even though the technology is probably going to improve um, there's a fixed number of bitcoin is there a way to increase the number of bitcoin or is that just set for eternity by those who govern uh the the, the currency of the chain is that yeah <clears throat> It's very publicly out there that there's a certain amount. There's a certain amount that was released, I think, in in two years' time or something like that. But you know, that's part of the driving the value of Bitcoin is that that there is a finite amount, and you know, you you can't simply um, you know mint new ones um, for that particular current coin. So that's the reason why you're continuing to see the Bitcoin price going up as people you know have more demand for Bitcoin. But equally, you see it going down when you certainly have a regulatory intervention where, for example, you had in the US, you had an, an exchange um, had all of their Bitcoins impounded, et cetera, in the US because they were unregulated, um, et cetera. Or you have China cracking down on, on, on Bitcoin mining, for example. These sort of events will cause massive volatility in the Bitcoin price. Um, uh, 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 as a result of it, because people know that there is only a, an infinite amount, and if some of those coins are being taken off the market, or um, you know, for law enforcement reasons, or um, you know, Bitcoin miners are, are, are no longer um, you know creating uh, uh, um, you know creating more to be distributed out in the market, 
um, then you know that, that that's going to cause volatility in the price. So there's an infinite amount, there's a finite amount of coins, but a lot of these coins somebody may have used 10 years ago and has forgotten the password. Right. Those are the sorts of coins that the miners are trying to find and trying to crack the code to be able to re reuse those particular, what I would say, um, you know, dormant coins. Okay, thank you. Um, so just uh, one more question here before we get going. Back, pivot topics a little bit. So of the common myths, misperceptions uh, that you mentioned, um, which one do you think is the most common and which one do you think is, I would say, uh, the most dangerous or something that people just need to kind of uh, get over it a bit, right? I yeah. don't put it that way. My interaction with treasurers, the biggest surprise they've had is around the an anonymity when they, they okay. all thought it yeah. was anonymous and it was therefore that's why criminals are using it, et cetera. But that's not the reality. Um, that in my mind is the biggest, you know, it, it, it's not, you know, from a risk perspective, if you understand that and you manage that, then you actually, um, you actually, um, you know, can take steps then to manage anti-money laundering risk and things like that um, and do, you know, try to do it, try to handle uh, cryptocurrency in a safer way within a corporate treasury environment. So, you know, from my discussion, that's probably been the biggest misconception that, you know, is a positive for using cryptocurrencies potentially um, than even using it over, uh, over fear because you've got much more transparency around that. But it just comes with the knowledge because there are anonymous coins out there that you absolutely want to avoid. <laughs> right, so I guess that kind of dovetails here. This question keeps burning in my mind as we go through this and some people have asked about it. And so uh, you you touched on a little bit, um, you know, about being able to trace, right, the kind of where the money came from, I'll put it that way. So for the companies maybe in the US that are using this, do, do the auditors uh, have an appetite yet or are they, seem to be is there a consensus around there so let's say i invest right in crypto so it's almost like is there any direction yet right from the audit community or is that just not happening yet <clears throat> so it's a very good point from an accounting perspective yeah. um you know it's not fiat currency so it's not a finite you know it's not an exact value from an accounting perspective you have to treat it as an investment uh, instrument that is that is going to need to be marked to market all of the time, um, so there's going to be a gain or a loss against right. it all of the time, which is one reason why, as we get on to adoption, you'll notice that you know I will start I will start to say that I'm not hearing many corporate treasuries are holding crypto right. because of the revaluation okay. uh, and tax implications on that uh, as a, as a result of it from that perspective. But you know, there is no crypto that's out there that is, um, you know, that has become like a unit of value from an accounting perspective. It always got to be revalued against fear. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and kind of do to the get to the meat. I want to make sure we have a time to let you go exactly. through. Exactly. Let, let, let's get to this. So, cryptocurrency adoption. So, I hear a lot of corporate treasurers say, "Well, I just don't need to get involved in this. This is all. This is all. Um, you know, this is all too complicated." Well, the first thing I'll say is. Some markets around the world, very few of them, but this is going to, I think, increase where cryptocurrency, e.g. Bitcoin, which is the, the main uh, the main the main one that this has happened with, has become legal tender in some countries. We've heard about El Salvador, um, but also there's been press recently in the last uh, six, eight weeks about Malaysia wanting to adopt uh, you know, Bitcoin um, as legal tender uh, as well um, going going forward. Now, the key thing is, again, there's a perception. It doesn't mean that the country, the only legal tender, <laughs> will be Bitcoin. It means that the national currency, and you know in El Salvador, that's the US dollar, um, will be continue to be legal tender. But also, you will have to give the ability to accept Bitcoin if a consumer or business wants to pay you in Bitcoin, um, for, for example. So, that's that's one of the reasons that I've seen the treasurers, you know, can no longer avoid it. They are having to get involved in it um, in their business around the world for that particular reason. And unfortunately, I think you're going to see more of this happening 
um, in, in, in the world, particularly in emerging markets. You may not necessarily see it in the US but, or, or in the UK or in Europe, you may start to see it in, in emerging markets. The other key thing that's a reality is the point I made around, there's a lot of um, digital native consumers and businesses that have got a lot of crypto wealth and they want to spend that crypto wealth on digital things. And those digital things may well be something called an NFT. So a net, fun, a, 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 a net fungible token or, um, is basically a digital ownership of a digital, it could be, um, uh, it, it could be the ticket, a ticket to a concert. It could be a digital version of a painting of somebody's, um, for example. These types of consumers like to buy and sell those things. And in a lot of cases, they like to use their cryptocurrency wealth to do that. Um, and if you are if you are a brand um, that wants to tap into that digital market, then you are going to have to offer um, uh, the ability to accept it in crypto, um, for example. But that doesn't mean you have to hold that money. You can you can easily sell something on an exchange related to your brand as an NFT. You can have that exchange via your uh, you know, via your auction site, uh, let's say accept Bitcoin and maybe Ether, for example, as the only two instruments that you will accept. And then as soon as that purchase has gone through on the blockchain, the exchange can automatically convert that to fiat and pay it into your fiat wallet with the exchange. And then you could potentially move that money out of the exchange and fiat into your normal banking system. So that is one area that I'm certainly seeing some very large U.S. companies get involved in, and they've been opening accounts with crypto exchanges as a result, um, and they are selling virtual um, NFT tokens out there, particularly in the sports sports brand industry, for example, um, all sorts, uh, all yeah. sorts of um, uh, uh, like that. Yeah, let me jump in here. Um, I guess it, it's probably me. I think it's a few other people. Um, can you give us a little bit um, real quick about what fiat means, uh, fiat? Yeah, yeah. so I, I think I covered it earlier. So it's a term that you'll hear used in the industry a lot, but basically your US dollar, your sterling, okay. your okay. euros, the traditional central bank backed okay. money in a digital currency world is known as fiat, okay. is known as fiat money. Now, what you will see evolving on blockchains is you will see central bank digital currencies also evolving. But again, they're not necessarily called fiat. They're called central bank digital currencies. That's not in existence yet, yet, other than in China um, as an example. But you will start to see that happening um, in other markets as central banks gear up to, to providing that in the future. So if I go on to the why not then, so as I say, um, digital native consumers, uh, I'm really am seeing corporate treasurers needing to gear up for that. The why not? The treasury investment policy does not allow you know, for you to make an investment in crypto. So there are a few companies that have, as you know, but in most cases, you won't have that being allowed in your investment policy. And even companies that I've seen accepting crypto, their investment policy does not allow them to hold it it is automatically exchanged into fiat as quickly as possible because the board would not allow them to do that. The AML is, 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 is too high. I don't want to get involved. Now, the one thing that I mentioned around visibility on the blockchain, now you might be comfortable that the last two or three participants have not been in a sanctioned country and you're comfortable that, those, that, 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 that chain is clean. But actually, if you go back, as I say, 20, 30, 100 steps in that chain, you may well find North Korea, or you may well find something you don't want to see from a sanction perspective. That part of what I would say the AML risk around that is still evolving. Regulators haven't got clear with it as well, but it is something you need to be aware of. There is a good thing around being able to see things, but if you do see things that you don't like, you can't get rid of them. <laughs> so, you know, you need to be very careful with that. Um, and that's something that needs to be, um, you know, a, a why not as well, because you need to make sure your organization is comfortable with that. 
as a result. The other thing that's important is that, well, and, and I think uh, many of you will go on to ask a further question on this, my relationship banks will not support crypto or the fiat proceeds from crypto. Now, this is something you need to be very, very careful with, because even if you're using an exchange and you're not using a bank, if you then want to move money out of that fiat wallet of that exchange into your normal case or Citibank account, etc., those banks may well stop those proceeds coming in because they can see that they've come as a result of crypto and they're not comfortable with accepting that. There are some banks that do accept that in the US. Um, uh, you know, uh, um, my bank that I, I work, work for in the UK accepted allowing fiat in and fiat out for regulated crypto exchanges only. Um, but it's something you need to be quite careful with that even if you are with a regulated exchange, it's probably worth doing some test transactions to make sure your relationship bank is not going to stop um, stop the proceeds from that. Um, as I say, you, you can open up, uh, uh, um, you know, you'll have to open up accounts. So the why not is you may not have the ability to open up an account with a non-bank. So crypto exchanges are typically e-money institutions, um, for example. So they're not regulated banks, but they are still fully regulated. Again, your board policies may not allow you to actually do that. You may have to get changes um, to, to do that. We talked about spreads already. Um, they're not cheap. You need to be careful with that. Um, the market is still not, you know, that well well developed. Um, and the other thing that is quite careful, as I mentioned, around when that value is changed on the blockchain, you cannot change it back. So having the ability to have multi-person authorizing a transaction is not very mature in the market. Some of the big crypto exchanges that are publicly listed and regulated do allow it for corporates. Um, it is it is starting to emerge, but you do sometimes, if you use certain exchanges, have a single point of failure of one person, which, as you can see, could be pretty dangerous. Um, you know, in uh, in this and from a, a segregation and, and uh, a duties perspective, you know, could be a real concern under your under your corporate treasury policy. Um, and, you know, a lot of people just said this is all too complicated and high risk and therefore I don't want to get involved. But, you know, I just go back to if you're a digital business and if your marketing area is wanting to do more in the digital world, you are going to have to start to look at this, unfortunately. <clears throat> OK, let me um, let me uh, stop here again um, for a little bit. Uh, Q&A, a um, little break here. Um, so. As you uh, as you were going through there at the end, it really uh, uh, brought a question um, to my mind. And so, you know, we talked about the why nots. Um, from your perspective, uh, what is something uh, that will happen um, out of the why nots that could really change the ball game? You feel in terms of uh, the treasurers and companies being more comfortable, uh, kind of using, yeah. you know, it's a it, it, it's I think the regulators getting their hands around regulating more exchanges and regulating more of the crypto coins itself, um, I think will mean that the treasuries will start to get more comfortable in uh, in using these. So, you know, as we've always seen in an unregulated world, it's very high risk. But I think as you start to see the regulators getting their hands around this more over the next 12, 18 months, 24 months or so, then you actually start to see the, the volatility in value of these things starting to come down as well. You're already starting to see it a little bit. Um, but, you know, I think um, regulation is going to be the friend of the treasurer to help them get more comfortable. If the regulator can get more comfortable, the regulators actually monitoring these things, then I think you'll start to see this this this, this, this being used um, more. Let me give you a, a, an interesting statistic around illicit activity around uh, around um, crypto, um, for example, in the market. If you look in 2021, a company called Chain Analysis, which is an anti-money laundering and an, an analyze analyze all of those steps in the chain and who's being a party to a particular blockchain 
they reckon that only 0.15 cent of transactions in crypto was uh, across what they call an illicit address or an illicit party on a particular chain. That's gone down quite significantly from around 3% or 3.3% 3 .3 in 2019. But I think what's important is also the value. Because crypto has gone up so much in the amount of value that's gone through it since 2019 to 2021, that 0.15% is still $14 billion worth of value, which is still quite significant. <laughs> that 3.3% in 2019 was worth 11.7 billion in value. So as you can still see, it's a problem. But the people like people like Chain Analysis and another company called Elliptic um, are really starting to develop the technology to help um, people understand where these coins have been. Is there an AML there risk? Is the sanction risk in it, etc. Um, to start to make it safer for uh, for corporates to use going forward and individuals as well. Okay, thanks. I want to kind of go back to um, a point that really uh, hit my, uh, and made my kind of, uh, I guess my radar go on. Whoa, 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 was uh, was a good, great point that you made. And so, you know, companies accepting uh, the fiat currency. So, are there any big banks out there um, that you see having more of an don't do it? You know, and so I'm just curious. Is there a resource where people could go? Um, to see yep. which banks do and don't. Is that out there yet? Yeah. Unfortunately, banks only will not publicize that they oh, will accept oh, okay. proceeds from crypto. Um, yeah. They keep it very quiet. Um, but my advice and what I've heard from other corporate treasurers in the market, and particularly in the US as well, is if you're dealing with a regulated exchange and that exchange is also listed, they're not having any issues with the crypto proceeds in fiat going into their normal banking system, whether that be with the Chase, with the Bank of America, or whether it's with the city, et cetera. So again, it goes back to the reason that corporate treasurers are picking regulated listed exchanges, well-known ones, et cetera, um, in order to do business with them, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, so, you also will find smaller regional banks in the US that market themselves as supporting crypto exchanges. I, you know, these will be very small institutions. They'll be your typical regional banks, as you guys, you know, as you all know very well in the US. So, you know, you've got a choice around the balance sheet that sits behind these institutions and do you really want to use those or do you you know can you, you can need to use your global american bank for example okay I hope that helps, me, helps helps a little bit yeah to me i just see this as, as if i was a regional bank and i had control on this might be a way uh when we start to see a little adoption if you're out in front of that a little bit maybe a way to get your foot in the door in terms yeah, of uh, but, uh, agreed um but again i'll go back to my experience ernie that with corporate treasurers in the US yeah. and very big multinational brands in the US. Uh, none of them have used those type of players. I've right. seen more what I would call crypto um, wallets or mm -hmm. crypto exchanges that aren't quite so highly regulated using those type of players is my experience. Okay, great. So let me go ahead and I'll give a few uh, key takeaways um, that I've kind of come to my mind. Um, putting my treasury hat on it as I love to do. Um, yep. And then we'll go ahead and, and let you make a few final comments. Um, I've got maybe one final question for you, Simon. Right. Um, so for me, um, I would say that I would I should have quote I should have reworded this a little bit. Cryptocurrency is not as complicated as advertised. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Uh, and the risk exposures, uh, I don't believe they're overly complicated. Uh, the regulatory environment across the globe is evolving rapidly. Um, again, I think once we see some traction here, I think once the, the ball's kind of rolling in the U.S., I think I think that will start to uh, re re reveal itself. But but that's never right. That's never something that's completely stable. You just have to make sure that you have a way to um, stay on top of this uh, cryptocurrency. It's not going away. Um, no. So this is my opinion. Um, I think if we're 
Exploiting cryptocurrency is eventually going to cause you business friction. So if you're just adamant about it, if you have too much of a risk averse, it's going to start to cost you if your customers uh, have other alternatives um, and they're not right uh, and you're not playing ball, um, so to speak. So it, it could be a way uh, also um, to show you, you know, show your customer friendly that experience. Um, so we have a, we have more questions, so we will take those and I'll I'll do my best to get back to folks and hopefully this is not our last uh, webinar. So uh, in wrapping things up, wrapping things up, uh, Simon. So if there are uh, three things um, that you could you could close on with uh, corporate treasurers and treasury professionals that they should take away from the webinar, what would those three things be from your perspective? I think it, um, num number one for me is that your point around this isn't going away. More and more businesses that are delivering things in a digital context will have to start to think to work out a way of accepting crypto. And I think what is so important is the corporate treasury to get involved early to be able to prepare the ground so that they can be best informed to manage those risks because those risks are there and they do exist from it. I, um, I, I'll give you an, an analogy. I've been in the industry a very long time. Around e-commerce, you know, 20 years ago, for example, a lot of businesses started to put up a website and started to put up a web shop and, and, and they would go and outside of corporate treasury, they would go and, and contract with a payment gateway. That came and gateway may not have qualified for the usual board approvals of accounts, et cetera, with, with a financial institution. But I think this is very like that scenario of 20, 25 years ago when people started to sell things on the web through e-commerce and start to use payment gateways, et cetera. It's really important for the corporate treasurer to understand the space. So when the business does want to start to accept it, you've got an exchange you're comfortable with. You know the procedures you'll have to go through. You know the changes that you'll need to need to make the board policies and things like that. And you'll know the mechanics around you know, managing that risk and not holding those, uh, the, the, those crypto coins. So the sort of, I would say, I'm not going to necessarily with the three things I think, Ernie, but in my mind, that is the number one thing that I certainly see corporate treasurers keeping them up at night, but get ahead and prepared for it. Because if you do, then I think you'll 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 be a better business partner to the business and you'll be better at managing the risk that you know you're going to have to uh, to manage uh, around this environment going forward and i do think that people shouldn't underestimate what i've seen is that people who didn't think manufacturing companies that you wouldn't think have got a digital arm within their within their actually do so for example if you are a manufacturer and you're going to issue a limited edition um, product you may well issue an nft with that and that consumer that's going to buy it may want to own that uh you know piece of equipment plus the nft and they may want to pay for it in crypto um, there's a great example of what i've seen what i would say it creep up on corporates where they don't necessarily think they've got a digital business well actually they're starting to have one <clears throat> Okay, amazing. So let me go make a few closing comments. Uh, first and foremost, um, Simon, thank you so much for making the time to share your uh, expertise with us. So I really appreciate you making time for us today. You're very welcome, Ernie. Thank you. And then, of course, um, everyone out there, um, I want to thank you for taking your time to invest with us today. This is, I would say, is a first in a series of webinars that I'm doing to expand um, what you had seen from me in terms of my content reach. So I'm trying to work with other partners, including co complex countries, and you'll see webinars um, that we don't have a partner for. So these are just topics that I think are incredibly important. And so uh, to you, everyone, again, I value each and every one of you and make the rest of your day great, everyone. Thank you, everybody. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks, Ernie.